So because of some YouTube guidelines, I will have to be censoring uh, some of this video. Um, I want to be able to upload it without having to worry about it being taken down by YouTube. And so because of that, I will be putting some censors up in certain places during the video. But if you would like the uncensored version, I'm going to upload that to members only, as well as some like uh, cut parts of this video. Um, I recorded hours and hours worth of content for this video that had to be reduced down to something that was digestible in one sitting. So if you would like to see the uncensored version of this video, as well as any parts that were cut out, I'm going to be posting that to members only probably sometime within the next couple of weeks. Hey guys, Sarah here. So this video is going to be about breeding corn snakes. It is breeding season or coming up on it for a lot of people, especially if you're in the Northern Hemisphere. And um, this is just a, an overview of how I go about breeding my corn snakes and what processes there are involved. Uh, before I jump in though, please like and subscribe and please share this video with anybody you think might benefit from it. I put out corn snake content every single week. So uh, if you know anyone in your life who is looking for corn snake information, that's basically what I do on this channel. I put out a video every single week that is mostly education based on corn snakes. So if you know someone or you are someone who uh, really likes or needs this type of information, uh, like I said, please like and subscribe. And uh, if you are already subscribed you would like to become a member that really helps the channel out it's two dollars and it gets you access to exclusive content like live videos after they're over uh, any type of like little rant videos that I might do or sometimes it's just as simple as a little video that I would post like maybe I get a new snake and I want to post a video about that but it's not necessarily education based and I still want to share it so I will normally share those type of things to members only so if you're interested in any of those things please consider becoming a member no pressure either way uh, like I I said it doesn't take away from the channel if you do not become a member it just helps motivate me to continue making things so this video is going to be a little bit like disjointed in compared to my other videos because it was filmed over a long period of time. Uh, it was filmed a little bit in the snake room and some of the things I'm going to be going over here. I also want to give a bit of a disclaimer. Uh, this video is about breeding corn snakes and you will be seeing some of those things. So uh, if you're someone who's a little bit squeamish or uh, anything like that, just remember this is for educational purposes only. And if that's not something that you really want to witness or see, um, this might be the time to click off the video because that is what this video is about so uh, just keeping that in mind and if you have young ones in the room it might be uh, a good video to maybe just tell them about later instead of having them watch it just keeping that in mind I'm gonna jump into the video so the first step is actually planning out different breedings and one of the most important things to do obviously is to know the difference between male and female. Uh, I have a video on how to tell that and I will link it above for you guys uh, and I will be linking a lot of videos above probably in this video if they don't all fit in the little card thing that shows up wherever it shows up uh, then I'll just put them down in the description um, because there's a lot of different references that I just couldn't cover in this video. If I did it would be super super long so just also mentioning like uh, if there's anything that you need extra references to those are going to be linked either above or below. So aside from just knowing male and female what I like to do at least a few months in advance is decide which pairings I'm going to do, who's going to breed, who's not going to breed, uh, and figure out what ultimately my goal is for this. If you're just a casual breeder and you don't really care too much about morphs and maybe you just have a couple of pets then uh, you know this this part of the process may be a given for you. Maybe you just have one male and two females females and that's all you plan to breed or something like that. Uh, this process may not be quite as important to you but as someone who is uh, actually breeding and um, selling snakes, um, whether you're making a living at it or not, I don't make a living at doing this. I have a whole other full-time job on top of the snakes and making the videos and having a life. Uh, so um, this is, even though it's not something I make a living off of, it is something that I do try to be a little bit more conscientious of than just throw a bunch of snakes together and see what happens. So the next step, like I said, is determining what you would get if you had certain pairings. And I'm not going to go over all the different genetic stuff, but that is something that is important to know if you want to like understand what you're breeding and what to breed to what. Uh, I did have a video very early on in this channel about like what should I breed my corn snake to. And um, ultimately it depends on what your goals are. I will link that video above as well if you guys want to go watch it. Uh, but like I said, it is very important if you plan to actually have goals 
goals with breeding long term to sort of understand the genetics and understand what you're going to get if you breed two different morphs of corn snakes together. After you've determined what you're going to breed together, uh, it's time to bring things out of brumation and bringing them out of brumation is another video that I did uh, last month. So if you guys uh, have been brumating and you're wondering how to warm them up safely, that's a good video to go watch. And if you are curious about brumating uh, and if you're in the southern hemisphere right now, you might actually start your brumation process very soon. Uh, I know that the seasons are opposite. So here it is springtime right now, but it might be autumn in the southern hemisphere so that's another video that you might want to go watch is how to brumate your corn snakes uh, and or hibernate them brumation is essentially hibernation for corn snakes it's not necessary uh, but it is helpful for some breeders especially when it comes to breeding and again i go over all of that in my other video so if you're curious about that you can check that one out so after you have decided who you're going to breed to whom and you have brought everybody out of brumation, uh, then you want to wait until the female sheds. And if you do not brumate, uh, you do kind of want to wait until the spring season and after your female sheds, start introducing her to males. I did have a question on one of my former videos as to like, if I don't brumate, how do I know when to pair the female with the male? And that's really the like determining time is let that female shed kind of in the springtime and and uh, then she will start putting off pheromones. So I would let her shed, feed her a meal like the day she sheds or maybe even the day after, and then start introducing her to a male uh, like within 24 to 48 hours of her having that meal, uh, especially if it was kind of a smaller meal, that might be a good idea. But uh, females will put off more pheromones after they've eaten than like before they've eaten. So if they've shed and they haven't had a meal, a male might not be quite as interested in her. But if she has a meal and it's even partially digested, she's going to be putting off more pheromones and the male will be more apt to want to breed to her. Yet another thing I forgot to mention in this video is that if you're having issues with the males in being interested in the females or vice versa, uh, you may want to add more humidity to the areas that your snakes are in. So whether it's individual enclosures or if you have just one room that all of your snakes are in, uh, I have a sort of very large walk-in closet type of thing that my snakes are in and I use ambient heat. And so I also have a humidifier that will humidify the entire uh, room uh, but I would also if you do not have that capability or don't want to humidify an entire room you can just mist the females enclosure and or males enclosure with just room temperature water and raise that humidity level that will also help them be more interested in breeding as well now I'm going to insert some clips of what I have done to breed corn snakes and my breeding process from this year. So you guys will be seeing some of that. The lighting isn't as good, the audio isn't as good, but you will get to see the actual process and I will be able to explain things as they happen instead of just trying to explain them without showing anything to you. So uh, moving on to that, again, this is one of those parts where if you do have children that you do not want to be seeing certain things, uh, or if you're sensitive to uh, animals potentially breeding with each other, then you may want to uh, not watch this part of the video. Okay, so it is uh, the 27th of February, 2022, and we are working on starting breedings. I've had a few females that have shed and getting ready to actually breed them. Um, and I have had a lot of trouble deciding which males are going to go with which females this year, but I think I finally settled on a decision and I'm going to let you know what pairs I have together right now. Sometimes I like to put them in these little uh, separate containers. This is, they're not locked. They kind of look like they are, but they're not. This is Miranda Ultramel uh, Okati, and that's Nectarine, who's a Halo Snow Okati. She is also a head anery, so um, we very well, oops, nope, please do not. We should get some Halo Snows and some nice reverse Okatees and stuff. Hey girl, how you doing? All right, I'm gonna close this so I can put her back in. Here's another pair that uh, hasn't locked yet. Uh, this is the female. This is Marigold. And that is Frangapani, the male. They are siblings. I wasn't going to pair siblings this year. But if we're going to have our Halo and Green Blatch Snows, this is going to be the best way to do that. I don't have another good male for her. I'm working on trying to get some Halos that are not related, especially males. Uh, or just Halos in general that are not related. So that I can actually, like 
put some new blood into these lines. But yeah, these two are in here. She may not be ready yet. She had a shed immediately after she came out of brumation. Uh, they've had three meals since coming out of brumation. And so uh, since she hasn't had that like official post brumation shed, uh, she may not be ready. And I'm probably going to separate them if they don't lock within the next few minutes. This is the was sold as a ghost blood red motley, but definitely isn't a ghost blood red motley female, Francesca. I put her with Casanova last year because uh, they were supposed to be, they were both supposed to be ghost, bo ghost blood red motleys, but whole, whole, whole thing. I'm not going to go over it right now, but this is Giovanni, the male that I hope to put her to. He's the only male that I have that is known homozygous hypo. Uh, actually, he's hypo and strawberry, but since they're allelic, it's fine. Uh, but it's really just to find out if the female is actually uh, a hypo type or, at all. Um, I don't really know. Like, she definitely looks like a hypo type. She doesn't look like a typical Anne-Marie Motley. Uh, but I don't have any other males to help prove a homozygous hypo or lack thereof. Um, Casanova is possibly head hypo, but that's also really complicated. So, um, yeah, I don't really know, but this is Giovanni. He's an ultra male Anne-Marie hypoberry hypo motley. Um, I know he doesn't look motley, but he's up from Tequila Sunrise lines, and sometimes they're motleys. Well, they just kind of look weird. And he's the only one on this bedding because uh, this is actually his enclosure. Oop. He is afraid of everything. I don't even know if he's ever going to breed, but that's okay. Um, but yeah, this bedding is to make him more comfortable because otherwise he is just the most uncomfortable snake. He cannot live on paper, and that's okay. Um, you know, part of my job as a breeder is to try to make all of my snakes happy and healthy. And if that means using a certain kind of bedding, then that's also fine. But yeah, I'm hoping that they decide to breed. If not, she will go to Casanova again this year. And uh, I'll just have to get a different hypo male for her. Yeah, he's he's terrified. He's terrified. In here, we have Casanova, who's the male uh, on top here. He is the was sold as a ghost blood red motley, but is not a ghost blood red motley male. <laughs> we don't know what he is. And I haven't named this big red coat Annery girl yet, but they are very fond of each other. Um... I had them together briefly last night and they might have locked. I didn't see it, but I saw some like, you know, remaining evidence. So we'll see. Um, I'm really only expecting anneries, but a lot of red coat anneries do come from like coral ghost lines. He has had a male, so we'll find out if she's had a male. Um, he's obviously motley. We'll find out if um, she's had motley. And um, yeah, I don't know. We might even find out if she's had hypo. He might have produced a hypo offspring last year so we'll see this is kind of a don't really have a plan just like which male seemed to be the best for this female and this was it so i guess we'll see so another pair that i'm trying out the big girl is uh empanada and that is actually her son ingot she, he might not be uh breeding age but she also has not had a shed since coming out of brumation this is just like introducing paris to see if anything happens uh, type of thing and um, it looks like they're not super interested right now, but we'll see. Um, he's not the ideal male for her, but I did not want to breed her to gelato again. I wanted to try her son and see if we can possibly get golden out of this line because she's possibly had golden and uh, gelato was too, but it's a long story. I'm just trying to see what we can do here. So I thought I'd breed her to a son instead of a sibling this year and see what we can get. As usual, Casanova seems to be getting the job done. You can see that they are considering locking. We might have a lock. Maybe. Um, I don't want to like disturb them too much. So there you go guys, first lock happening on the 27th of February, 2022. This is over in the snows might have a first or a second lock happening can't really tell but it looks like it looks like we have lock number two also happening same day there they are and we appear to be locked so there we go all right i'm gonna leave them alone and as mentioned with this pair uh she's not super interested He's interested, but he probably also smells the other females that are ovulating, so uh, we're just going to try this again in about a week as well. So now that we've had two breedings, give them a lay box. Uh, just make sure they have fresh food and water and pretty much just wait. Like, that's what we're playing the waiting game with these females now. 
uh, and it's really nice that we got two uh, at the same day. Um, I don't typically, I don't want to say I don't typically because I do introduce them at, on the same days, usually like this. I'll, I'll take all the pairs that I want to pair and put them together for 10 to 15 minutes. If I don't like get any locks, then I just uh, put them back and wait another week. Um, you can, you typically should probably wait until the female sheds. Uh, and normally I would, but a few of these females shed like immediately after coming out of brumation. Uh, and the Anne female wasn't brumated at all. So uh, it's kind of like, let's just put it together and see what happens. If it takes, it takes. And um, yeah, I think that we had a pretty successful day. The uh, two Anneries, um, Splinter and uh, Casanova are now separated so I'm going to put Casanova back in his own enclosure. I'm going to be separating everybody and then we'll be back. I mean to you guys it'll just be a couple minutes or maybe a couple seconds but for me it's going to be next week so. Hey everybody Sarah you're back in the snake room. It is Friday uh, March 4th now. Um, I am trying some of these pairs again that didn't want to go last time and um, as far as the normals that I was going to maybe breed the mom and son to. Uh, she is in blue right now. I did put the son in with her and uh, nobody's showing really any interest. So I'm going to probably wait till after she sheds, which will probably be like another week, which is what I was expecting. But um, I have the uh, Okati Ultramel with my Halo Snow Okati also together. She already shed. Um, and he's showing a lot of interest in her, but she's not really showing a lot of interest in him. And I'm also trying my like female Anne-Marie Motley questioning, don't know if she's a hypo or not, with my um, Red Factor Hypoberry Ultra Male Anne-Marie Motley boy, uh, and we'll see uh, if they show any interest. Alright, so we have these two. Uh, this is the um, Ultra Male Okati to Halo Snow Okati. Um, he's into it, she's really not. We don't have a lock. They've been together for, I don't know, 5-10 minutes, like not that much. But she's heckin' not interested. Um, so, you know, this might just be one that we wait a little while longer. I love how she just looks like a, a nice tiger or something. Uh, I don't know, I just love her colors. And I love his colors too, that's part of the reason I want them to go together. Uh, but yeah, I, it's not looking like this pairing is gonna happen today. Which is fine. We will wait until later. See, he's really interested. Um, and he knows, like, even though he's a first-timer, he's he's been doing pretty good. As far as, like knowing what movements to do, but she is just not having any of it, so we'll see. Okay, so I might have been wrong about them not being ready to go. Not sure how happy she is about it, but it looks like we might have a lock. Do we or do we not? Looks like we do. Camera's still not, there we go. Definitely a lock. Nice. All right, so we have breeding at number three in the books with this amazing, lovely pair. Okay, so this is a little gross, but this is the aftermath to a breeding session. This is the container that the uh, Okati pair was in. Uh, so if you ever just leave your snakes, your pairs alone uh, for a while, you know, you walk away for 15, 20 minutes, maybe an hour, and you come back, um, this is what to look for. Uh, a lot of people will put white paper or paper towels down so that it's easier to see. Um, I have in the past just like left pairs together for like overnight um and you know this is how we would kind of know that something did happen so um that's kind of what to look for you can imagine what that is um it came from the mail if anybody wants to know um i'm trying to remain youtube friendly so you know this is for educational purposes only if you're planning on breeding your snakes and um you don't see them lock but you see this there's still a good chance that breeding happened so we do have some proper chasing going on um, this like sort of chasing running uh, is natural so I know a lot of people have been like but it seems like he's putting way too much pressure on her or whatever like this is the natural mating dance um, yes that's it's natural for her to run and for him to chase and then um, if she finds that he's willing she will lift up her tail and let him do his thing um, you know there's no such uh thing as snakes uh, not being willing to participate. Um, if a female does not want to lift up her tail, then she will not lift up her tail. That's that's just the way it is in the snake world. So even though I know that in human terms it might look, um, 
you know, questionable. Um, this is, this is not what that is. The females do have to be willing. We do have tails. Oh, no, we don't have tails anymore. I was going to say for a second, the tails were close to each other back there, but they, she quickly moved. This is the male, by the way, right here. Uh, female head is over there. My camera is not loving focusing through these containers. Doing my best here. So I think that we're close to a lock, even though I can't get my camera to focus. Um, can't really tell yet. It doesn't really look like it. Nope, we're moving around. And to me, that just kind of means like, all right, so we've had an opportunity for a lock, a perfect opportunity, and it hasn't happened. So that probably means that this session's not going to be successful. Um, he's still trying. I'll give just a couple minutes, but I'm not gonna like, you know, wait forever because that's just going to stress both of them out. So, um, I see one tail without the other tail right now. So that probably means that's a no. Um, I see obviously male tail without female tail. And I think that that's our cue to call it a day for this, for this pair. Uh, and it was the same with the other pair, the, uh, normal pair that I had, uh, I guess they're, they're actually both yellow jackets, but whatever. <laughs> uh, so yeah, sorry that these are like not super in focus and they're hard to see, but uh, this is the best way that I can really do it to show you guys, but also keep them um, in their enclosures because I'm only one person holding the camera. So yeah, all right, I'm putting these two back. Uh, as much as he's interested, he might also just smell other females around here who are ready. Um, so he's going to persist until he tires out and she's just going to get stressed. So, yep, quitting this, quitting this. So the conclusion for today, which is the 4th of March, I keep looking at my watch because I forget what day it is, is we have one extra breeding and it's been not quite a week since the last, uh, the last breeding. It's been like five days. I think I did the, the whole last thing on Sunday. It is now Friday, so it's, it's been not quite a week. The next time I'll try is probably about another week from now. Uh, there's a chance that I might try the big female um, this like coming Sunday or Monday. Uh, it kind of depends on where she is in her shed cycle. If she sheds, I'll definitely try it and film it, of course. Uh, and when I try her, I may also try uh, Francesca, the Anne-Marie Motley ghost, whatever she is, um, with a male. I may try again with Giovanni, but I'll be completely honest, Giovanni does not seem interested at all. Like. It's like he just has zero instinct for breeding, and that's okay. Um, I didn't buy him specifically as a breeder. I bought him kind of knowing he was a little off. Um, he was a trouble feeder growing up, and that's part of the reason why the breeder sold him. And so I'm not even sure if I really want to pass that on to any offspring anyway. We'll see. Uh, but yeah, that's that's today's, today's adventure. Um, we have two more females that I'm sure I'm going to try to breed. I'm going to end this, this video now and get everybody back sorted where they're supposed to be. And, uh, yeah, give you guys an update next week or whenever, whenever I can figure out who's going to breed. <laughs> okay, so I'm back. It is Wednesday, March 9th, um, and we had my big female. She shed this week, so I'm going to try to pair her with one of the younger males that I'm really hoping she will breed to. Um, and if they are not interested at this point, I'm probably going to pick a different male. So, uh, let's just see what we got. I'm also going to try to pair that, like, whatever ghost motley looking female that I have is with the Hypoberry Ultra Male Annery Motley Boy, who is always uncomfortable, Giovanni. Um, I'm going to try to put them in, like, a separate enclosure, like I did with some of the other pairs, to see, to see if that would help. I don't know. Um, he's not very comfortable, like, anywhere ever, except when he's on like aspen bedding and so i don't know i'm just gonna give it a shot maybe he's too distracted by everything else going on in his cage we're just gonna see what we can do here so here's the francesca and giovanni pair giovanni you are so pretty why do you not want to breed uh yeah he has had zero interest she's just been cruising so i might actually just try casanova with her because that's been a successful breeding in the past um, 
and I'm probably not going to put them on this bedding. The only reason that they're on this bedding right now is because that's the only way that he is ever comfortable. So I'm going to remove the bedding and put Casanova in and just see if we get a lock. If not, it could just be that it's because she's not ovulating yet. Okay, so we have some twitching and some following going on with the uh, Casanova Francesca pair, which tells me that she is likely ovulating um, and Giovanni just is not a breeding snake. He's just not. Um, which is okay, it's unfortunate, but um, this is the second year I've tried to breed him and it's not a size problem. Um, it's a it's a Giovanni problem. <laughs> so uh, Giovanni might actually be on his way to going to a new home at some point. Um, you know, he's not a super lovey-dovey snake, but like, again, this is the second year in a row. I've tried him with five different females that I knew were ovulating and um, he's not, Giovanni has not been at all interested, so um, yeah, he might end up going to a new home. Um, I am going to wait and see, though, if these two do decide to pair up. Female is, uh, being a little hard to get right now. Still have some very active chasing going on. Uh, that's the female's tail closest to us there, and the male's tail coming up. Oh, oh. It looks like he might have tried. He's trying. What do we got? Do we have a pairing? That's really the question. It kind of looks like we might. Alright, here's the other side. That definitely appears to be a lock. So there we go. We only have one more female after this to breed, and probably Giovanni is just going to be a pet because, um, yeah, he wasn't even trying. So there's that. This is for educational purposes only, guys. Okay, so I'm sorry that I didn't get to film this, but I left these two alone for like 10 minutes and here we are. Um, this is mother to son. It's not the breeding that I definitely wanted. I was hoping for the other younger male, but you know what, I'll take it. I think they're locked, but not 100% sure. Um, I can't really tell. So I'm going to gently, very, very gently just lift up both tails just to see. Okay, we are locked which is awesome. So I'm just gonna leave them alone for a little while. Um, <laughs> uh, this is actually the next day. So this is the 10th of March, 10th of March, 2022. So there's that pairing. Um, and yeah, all of the pairings are in the books right now. One thing that I wanted to mention that I didn't mention before is that sometimes I will leave pairs just together. Uh, to breed, which is kind of what happened with this pair of the normals, the mother and son pair. Um, I left them alone more because she is a little bit more of a private breeder. Uh, every time that I've tried to breed her, uh, there's been nothing happening while I've like been in the room waiting. And I don't know if it's because she's very focused on me, but um, this it's been that way, like, I guess I thought it was the other male. So I've been breeding her to a sibling for a few years now. And I thought that it was probably him that was the holdout, and he was the one who was very private. But it might just be her, because she uh, has never really, she's never, like, actively been, like, receptive when I've been in the room. So I put the male in with her and walked away for 5-10 minutes, and when I came back, as you could see, they were locked. So as much as I wish that I could have recorded all of that for you, I recorded a couple locks for you guys, so it's not like you didn't get to see, you know, any of the action. Um, or, or at least the process is kind of the, the main goal of this whole video, is so that you guys can see the process. Um, and so with them, even though you didn't get to see the process, um, you didn't get to see, sometimes you do have to walk away. Uh, sometimes you have to walk away for five or ten minutes and then come back. Um, and because sometimes they don't want you to be in the room. Yeah. Sometimes they want their privacy. So just mentioning that. One thing that I forgot to mention when I was recording this video is that sometimes corn snakes will have a sort of love bite uh, as they are breeding. Sometimes the male will bite the female. And uh, usually this is just to hold on because a lot of times the females are very mobile. 
This is not really anything to be concerned about, and it doesn't happen very often, but it does happen occasionally. This is more common in things like king snakes and milk snake species, but corn snakes do it occasionally as well. A couple other tips when it comes to breeding is uh, if you have one male and multiple females, I recommend not breeding your male to more than five females in a breeding season. Uh, some people even limit it to three instead of five. Um, there's only so much really that the male can do. And especially if you're someone who wants to pair each pair multiple times, that kind of decreases the number of potential fertile eggs that you will get if you continue to try to breed a male to so many different females. So uh, if you are breeding a male to two females, Females, and let's say you want to pair them each three times, he's pretty much going to be depleted at that point. Uh, so just kind of be aware of what your males are and are not capable of. Uh, I also wanted to mention these sibling breedings and uh, any other related breedings. This is not as critical in corn snakes as it is in uh, other types of animals like mammals and things. So um, I know that kind of sibling breedings or uh, mother-son breedings and stuff like that seem very taboo, uh, but it doesn't seem to affect them as much in the grand scheme of things. As long as you do not continue to interbreed too much, a lot of people will say three uh, three generations of inbreeding and then you definitely want to stop. Um, I don't even normally go that far so just keeping that in mind, uh, breeding siblings and things like that is how we tease out these recessive gene mutations. Uh, pretty much all of the recessive gene mutations that you're going to see on the market resulted in some kind of inbreeding. Not all of them but many of them so just keep that in mind. It isn't as taboo uh, for a couple generations with snakes as it is with something like dogs or cats, it's not going to cause as many issues. Uh, I also want to mention that if uh, you want to avoid some headaches, take the water bowls out of enclosures when you're breeding because they are uh, probably going to get messy if you don't. So I'm going to give a brief overview of all of that. Essentially, uh, after the female sheds, you introduce the male to her. It doesn't really matter if you put the male in with the female or the female in with the male or if you put them in a separate enclosure. Sometimes I will put them in completely separate enclosures just because it's easier for me to keep track of them. But typically, I prefer to put the female into the male's cage. I didn't do that in this video just for the sake of the video, and it obviously didn't matter that much. Now, a few people do ask me about ages and sizes for breeding. Um, we go through the rule of threes for females. So three years old, three feet long, 300 grams. Uh, so you definitely want to have a scale. A scale is very important. You can get a pretty cheap kitchen scale that just reads grams and that's fine. Uh, it doesn't have to be anything super precise. You just want it to be like within a gram for the most part. For males, it's actually more of like a rule of two-ish kind of. For males, it's not near as uh, critical as it is for females. Females have to carry eggs and so they will lose some weight when they go through the breeding and laying process. So you want to make sure that they have that weight on them. Uh, the males, not necessarily so much. Uh, the males, like I said, you could kind of do more of a rule of twos if you wanted uh, something more precise. So two years old, 200 grams and two feet long. I did breed two two-year-old males this year. and uh, I was actually, that's the youngest I've ever bred a male before is two years old. And uh, the classic male that I bred to his mom, which I will get into that in a minute. Uh, that is the smallest male I've ever bred and I was actually kind of surprised that he did it. Um, I tried actually to breed one of his male siblings who's slightly smaller and he would not breed. Uh, so he was right on the cusp of being able to breed and he's not even 200 grams. He's, he's more along the lines of 150 grams. So he was very small but he still got the job done. So a lot of people also ask me uh, what's the deal with inbreeding, breeding siblings, breeding, um, you know, mother with uh, son, stuff like that. Uh, and I don't typically do that and I don't necessarily recommend it for long periods of time. It does seem like for at least three generations, it usually doesn't have any negative effects. So when I say three generations, I mean, uh, let's say you pair siblings together, that's generation one, and then you take their offspring and breed them together, that's generation two, then their offspring spring and breathe them together. That's generation three. And that's pushing it for me. I typically do not go even that far, but um, you can. And that seems to be sort of the safe number. Um, and it's not that I've seen necessarily any other issues going on with that. Uh, and that is the best way to tease out other gene mutations. But sometimes those gene mutations can be negative. 
And that's why I recommend not inbreeding, like too far beyond that. Uh, however, if you are not comfortable breeding, inbreeding a mother, son, or siblings or anything like that, definitely don't. It is better safe than sorry. When it comes to the mother, son breeding that I did this year, uh, that's not something that I would typically do, especially since the son is actually also the son of her sibling. So I bred siblings together and then that son was bred back to the mother. Typically I wouldn't do that, but we are trying for golden corn snakes in that breeding and golden is a, an extremely rare gene mutation that we just don't see that many of ever and it has been a long like hard road for golden I did a video on goldens uh, that I will link above or maybe below depending on how many I can only link five videos above so if I have linked more than five above at this point everything else will go down below for you guys to reference so when it comes to getting goldens, um, it's a matter of trying to just keep the gene mutation alive and in the hobby and uh, we can outcross later on, which is definitely the plan. To my knowledge, there's only maybe three, maybe four people who are actively able to be working on the Golden Project, and I am one of them. And unfortunately, uh, inbreeding just sort of comes with that uh, right now. So after everybody is bred, all the females get a lay box. And if you're wondering um, how it'll make the lay boxes, I will link that above. I will keep the lay box in with the female the whole time that she's gravid and even until she has a shed after laying eggs. So those lay boxes, it's very important to make sure you keep them clean. Sometimes the females will actually poo in the lay box. So it's important to take that out and either replace it with a completely brand new lay box or to at least clean it out really well and replace the bedding in the lay box. I like to do a mix of perlite and vermiculite for both my eggs and my laying females but everybody is a little bit different on what they prefer. Some people like to do perlite only for incubating their eggs or vermiculite by itself only for incubating eggs. Uh, and I'll get into any egg incubation information next month when we talk about uh, that kind of thing, or at least maybe it'll be the month after next. It kind of depends on whatever I get eggs. When I get eggs, I will do a video on how to take care of the eggs and incubate them but I do keep the lay box with the female the whole time that she's gravid and um, she will shed shortly after laying eggs as well. So I usually let her keep the lay box until after that shed because it's also meant to be moist the whole time as well. It's kind of a moist box. If anybody's heard of a moist box before, uh, it's a box that most people would normally put in uh, the snake's enclosure when the snake is getting ready to shed. That way they can get that extra humidity and it's easier for them to shed. Essentially, this is a semi-permanent moist box that I just keep in the whole time that she's gravid and then after she shed. I will also be going over post care for females that have laid eggs in a different video. I'm not gonna go over that here because this is strictly just breeding stuff. Uh, but I just thought I would let you know. Uh, and there are some issues that can happen during breeding. Uh, but sometimes a male will have a prolapsed hemipene. Uh, the males do sort of eject themselves uh, out and then into the female. And uh, sometimes that can go wrong and they can become engorged and cannot pull back in. And when that happens, you want to put them in some sugar water. I usually do one part sugar, one part water and the water being uh, maybe just slightly above room temperature. You don't want it to be hot though. You just want it to be barely warm or maybe even room temperature would be okay. Uh, put their tail end in there and that will help the uh, blood vessels to constrict and he'll be able to pull that back in. This is how you want to handle a lot of different prolapses, but if it doesn't pull back in within five or 10 minutes, uh, you may want to go to a vet and have them handle it. And when I say other type of prolapses, there are other types of prolapses that can happen. Uh, I'm not going to go into that, but um, bowel and things like that can also prolapse. And in those cases, probably a vet visit is going to be best. Uh, just kind of keep in mind, like I always advocate for taking your animals to the vet if you have any concerns. I'm not a veterinarian. I am not trained in that kind of thing. I did take pre-vet in college, but I didn't uh, like finish that degree. And even with pre-vet, I would not be able to like actually give you medical advice for your animals other than go to an actual veterinarian who knows what they're doing. This part is not necessarily directly related to breeding, but I thought I would mention it because it is going to come up in a 
egg laying and I thought I would kind of mention it because it's not about incubating eggs. It's actually more about taking care of the female. So um, the female can become egg bound if she's laying eggs. So just uh, keep an eye on her. Most females should uh, finish laying all of the eggs in their bodies within 24 hours. So if you have a female that's getting ready to lay right now and you are looking for that type of information, uh, that's that's just out there. Um, I'm not going to be worrying about that for another like six-ish weeks. So um, I didn't want to make a whole video on it right now, but I did want to mention if you notice that your female still has eggs in her after 24, maybe 48 hours, take her to a veterinarian. Uh, don't try to do things yourself unless you are trained in medical stuff. Um, there are videos on the internet where uh, it shows you how to aspirate eggs. And essentially what that means is you would take a syringe, uh, it literally insert it into your snake and pull out the eggs contents so that the egg is smaller and easier for your snake to pass. That is something that is a possibility, but I don't recommend doing that unless you are trained in doing that. I also don't recommend um, moving the egg around or trying to push it out yourself. Um, a lot of times eggs will get stuck in females and trying to move them around yourself will actually rip the inside, the inside of the uterus and it can cause her to hemorrhage and potentially pass away. So I highly recommend uh, taking your snake to the vet if you notice any egg biting. Like I said, any kind of medical concern, just take your animal to the vet. Uh, and if you can't afford the vet, you can't afford the pet. I know that that's not something that a lot of people want to hear, but that is uh, a huge thing. And that's one big reason that I would say, make sure you definitely want to breed your corn snakes. Make sure you actually want to do this because there are health risks involved for both the male and the female, more the female than the male, but again, there are health risks for the male as well. So um, just make sure that you are prepared financially to take any animals to the vet that might have a problem. So whether it's a prolapsed hemipene or whether it's an egg bound female, uh, you wanna make sure that you do have the money and the ability to take your animals to the vet, even if it's an emergency vet. That's gonna be it for this video. I hope that it helped. I hope that you got all the information that you needed. Uh, I'm sorry that it seemed a little disjointed, but I wanted a lot of this to be sort of uh, more or less live, even though this is not like a live video. I wanted you guys to be able to actually see the process that I go through. Either way, enough of me rambling. I really hope that you enjoyed this video. And if you have any questions, please feel free to leave them in the comments. And if I did miss anything, I'm happy to answer uh, those questions in a future video. In fact, uh, next month's video, since I probably won't have eggs by then, uh, next month's video around this time will probably be a Q&A where I go through all of the comments on all the videos for the last few months and just answer those questions uh, in a video for you guys so that everybody can get that. So if you do have questions, even if they aren't related to breeding corn snakes, if you have questions, feel free to leave them under this video and they will probably be featured in a Q&A next month. And I will also be answering the questions in the comments as well. So if you leave a comment, don't, don't feel like it's going to be a whole month before you get an answer. It will honestly probably get answered within a day or two, uh, at least as a reply on your comment. So thank you for watching. I will see you in the next video which is going to be the Ultra Morph Deep Dive, which is one I'm really, really excited about because Ultra is probably one of my favorite gene mutations out there. So very excited about that. Thank you for watching. I'll see you then.